Australia's first Indian magazine to have a national reach. Indus Age is the largest circulated South Asian magazine in Australia with five simultaneous editions. 55,000 copies printed monthly, 220,000 readers, largest network of clients, undisputed leader in community news. Indus Age is circulated in Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Brisbane and Perth to over 525 outlets. Grab your copy now to get the latest on the community, news from India, Bollywood, music and much more. For more info, log on to www.indusage.com.au. Hello everyone, I am Karishma Bojwani and welcome to In This Age, an Australian-wide newspaper and magazine for the Indians. We're here at the Jaipur Literature Festival in Adelaide and I am sitting with a man difficult to pin down, an award-winning travel writer, historian, archaeologist, curator, as well as a prominent broadcaster and critic. He has written about the Middle East, Asia and particular, particularly India. He is also one of the co-founders and co-directors of the Jaipur Literature Festival, which is where we are today. Yes, I am talking about William Dalrymple. Thank you so much for being with us Thank here you, today. Thank you, Krishna. So, it's such an honor to meet you Thank today. You. And um, I'm going to jump straight into the questions. Please do. So, William, you had a particularly untraveled childhood. You stayed in Scotland and you traveled the first time to India when you were 18. Can you tell us more about this? Yes, I grew up in a very beautiful part of Scotland and my parents took the view that people would come to them because every summer <laughs> there would be this great arrival of visitors from the south coming to see Scotland. Mm -hmm. uh, and we hardly ever went away. Mm -hmm. uh, we had one holiday, bizarrely, during the Easter holidays, which is when Scotland is at its most wet. Yeah. Uh, to somewhere on the west coast that's even wetter than where we were. <laughs> so my memory of childhood holidays is rain drizzling down windows and uh, yeah. wet walks and occasionally wet boat rides. And, uh, um. So when I, through a whole series of accidents, ended up in India mm -hmm. at the age of 18, it was dazzlingly yeah. different. I mean, it's, it's different for even the world most travelled yes. cosmopolitan people coming from the, the relatively bland west. but. Uh, for someone that was as untraveled and uncosmopolitan and, and as Scottish as I was at that yeah. point in my life, it was just sort of mind blowing. And uh, it did really genuinely blow my mind. Well, I, and I'm still there now. Still I'm there. still at the end of a, the longest gap year in history. <laughs> 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 what was your experience when you first arrived? What was going through your mind when you first left? So I was already heavily into history. I was going mm -hmm. up to Cambridge to study history. Mm -hmm. And so I reacted to it in the way that I suppose I, I do react to things, which is looking at the history and, and reading the history. and. And once I started reading about the moguls, yeah. everything sort of uh, okay. they, they made sense. Uh, okay. And I spent a lot of the year going around different sultanate and mogul ruins in Mandu and oh. Agra. Uh, then discovered the deep south and discovered the great Hindu empires of Vijayanagara. Wow. Uh, went to Mahabalipuram and saw Arjun's penance. And it was like one of the most sort of incredibly educative years. Mm -hmm. Not only was I discovering all these different histories of different parts of India, but you know, discovering the language, the people, people, the food. Um, and in a sense, I've spent the, the next 30 years digesting yeah, that. <laughs> You're still there. <laughs> Processing it. You and I still have by no means finished. I mean, finished. You know, there's still, you know, I could spend three more lifetimes, I think, and still find wow. things that I, you know, I'm longing to write about that I haven't yet had time to. You live in a farmhouse in South Delhi. Correct. I find that very fascinating. So why do you choose to live in Delhi? Yeah, people say that increasingly. <laughs> 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 I really could live anywhere. Um, okay. And uh, it is true that at the moment we're speaking, Delhi is this noxious, polluted yeah. place that I think is literally the most polluted place in the world currently. Uh, but it's not like that. The rest of the year. Uh, this is a very specific thing that happens after Diwali coincides mm -hmm. with the crop burning okay. in the Punjab. Yeah. Uh, and it's an amazingly interesting city. Uh, it's got, it's the only city in India that's a properly pan-Indian city. Mm -hmm. uh, you will find as your neighbours Bengalis, Himachalis, yeah. Tamils, Gujaratis, Everything. in a way that you just don't in Calcutta, which is really a Bengali city, city. Or, or Hyderabad, which is mainly a, a, a Telugu city, city or yeah. Bangalore, which is largely Tamil or, or Canada city. Uh, it's, it is the New York of India in a way it wasn't. Wow. It used to be the it used to be the Washington of India, it used to be a government city, a small government city. city. Now it's become this sort of big, swaggering megalopolis with you know, amazing entertainment, amazing food, but also all things I originally loved, the old pigeons, the Sufis, yeah. the, the Dargas, the ruins. Uh, and that's so all why that's not still. Mumbai then? So Mumbai, 
is wonderful and I love mm -hmm. going to Mumbai. Um, it's got the whole glamour world of magazines and film stars and advertising. But Delhi actually, oddly enough, is the intellectual centre of the city mm -hmm. now, of the, of the country now. Yeah. Um, in, okay, in a way it wasn't even 20 years ago. Uh, I mean, I think Bengalis would have certainly claimed uh, uh, Calcutta as the intellectual centre 20 years ago. Yeah. But it isn't now. Okay. All the publishing is in Delhi. In Delhi, okay. All the authors live in Delhi, if you live in Bangalore. Mm -hmm. um, and the only publishing really that's in, in Bombay is, is now the glamour, mm -hmm. you know, Vogue and yeah. that sort of thing. Um, and so within Delhi, you have this you know, lovely world of, of writers and, and uh, reviews and uh, book readings mm -hmm. and, and so on. And, uh, and yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very active intellectual world. And so as far as I need recharging on that front, that's all there. There's also, you know, in, in, uh, in winter, there's the whole of Rajasthan and Madhya yeah. Pradesh to explore. In summer, there's the Himalayas not far away. Um, wow. So I'm very happy. Yeah, and, I'm, like, and, I, so and I have enough. Um, I live on this farm in a way that I couldn't possibly afford to live anywhere else. Oh. With, with, with you know, lovely garden where I grow my own veggies, have my own goats, make my own yeah. goat's cheese, and uh, <laughs> it's pretty idyllic. And if I want, to, as at the moment I'm in writing a book and I hardly leave the house, uh, mm. sit in there, chained to my desk, but other times, it, you know, there's a whole social world there if I want it. If you want to. I've heard that your writing process is very unique. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I don't know if it's unique at all, but it's, it's very specific. Okay. Um, I am a historian, so I write history mm -hmm. books, and I spend sort of five years, or uh, if it's a big project, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, uh, the, the, some, some books have been less, but it's normally a five-year cycle, okay. uh, gathering material. Um, and then the actual writing is quite a quick process at the end, it's the final year. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm in that year at the moment. It is, this is my, I've just come out of a, a really intensive month of writing, right. uh, with three chapters down. Wow. And I've been sitting editing in the hotel. Oh, that's the time that you And I do go slightly stir crazy and bonkers. I do like to travel and I like to go out and, the, and I'm not doing either of that at the moment. But okay. it is, it's, it's, it's the sort of, it's, the, it's like at the end of a university, you spent three years having fun, then you've got to do finals yeah, okay. and you've really <laughs> got to go do your work for your, your finals. Work. It's the same sort of theory. It's the, and this will now allow me uh, at least a year of launching the book next year. So. <laughs> <laughs> so By which time I'll be sick to the back teeth of talking and interviewing and travelling and longing Dang. to come back and sit at home and read some books. So this is the time you're kind of you're on your last year. Exactly. Putting it down. Yeah. So talking about your works, your writings reflect a lot on you know, the South Asian history. So what are the features that about this region that entices you the most? So I've had sort of quite a lot of different careers mm -hmm. within the 30 odd years now mm -hmm. I've been in India. At different times I've been the foreign correspondent, mm -hmm. um, I've been a magazine feature writer, I have been a festival director, which I still am I suppose. Yeah. Um, I have uh, written, I curated art history mm -hmm. uh, exhibits, uh, been a literary critic and India has sort of facilitated all that yeah. uh, and a different, I've also been a photographer I and mean, so at different times it, it, it's, it's a very fertile field it, it, you know there are many ways in which it stimulates you and there are many ways as a writer or an artist that you can react to it and, yeah. and it's, it allows me a sort of freedom and diversity which mm -hmm. I think I wouldn't have anywhere else yeah. um, and so it's been a very accommodating host I, I, I feel very grateful to it. Um, it's, yeah, it's just, it, it, it's often irritating, but it's yeah. never boring. Never boring. <laughs> <laughs> so it keeps you going. Yeah. <laughs> um, what drives you to write, to write a book? It's always, I'm always pulled by a subject rather than, okay. um, uh, you know, I, I latch on to some it's story writing. I've heard at a dinner party or okay. somewhere, or I've been somewhere and come across a particular tale and I want to read about it and, yeah. and that leads to other journeys and you put it all together and it becomes a book. Um, but it also, I should say that, I mean, I have friends, I have friends and family who are enormously talented in, in mm -hmm. a whole range of different things. Um, and you know, some of them could have been opera singers or ballerinas yeah. or whatever, uh, or businessmen or lawyers. I really, I, I, I have one talent, yeah. <laughs> which, is really, which is to write. Um, I could never hold down a proper job. Okay. Um, I'm far too erratic and badly behaved and <laughs> late and unpunctual and uh, moody and difficult for, for holding down any kind of sensible job. job. Um, and the writer is a, is a very accommodating 
um, space. space for me, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, you have spoken about the myth of the Kohinoor. Can you briefly tell us a little about that? So Kohinoor was, was a very nice little, that, I mean, I talked about these big five-year projects. Kohinoor yeah. was not one of those. Kohinoor okay. was, was a really quite quick response to a particular news item okay. which turned up. Mm -hmm. When the Indian Solicitor General um, surprised many people by suddenly declaring three years ago that uh, the Kohinoor was not loot. Mm -hmm. uh, it was given to the British by Ranjit Singh and therefore there would be no formal Indian government claim to yeah. repatriate it. Now this is a great surprise to many people, particularly any historians <laughs> who yeah. knew very well that the Kohinoor uh, was uh, taken by the British at the Treaty of Lahore in 1849, 10 years after Ranjit Singh was dead. So unless he gave it by Ouija board or astral <laughs> projection, it was difficult to see how, how um, uh, Ranjit Singh had anything to do with this. And it was indeed taken really at the point of a bayonet when the Sikhs had been defeated in the Second Sikh War, um, and it was taken by Lord Dalhousie to give to Queen Victoria. So I and my colleague Anita Anand, who had both mm -hmm. written about the Kohinoor in our previous books, mm -hmm. obliquely, it had been glittering in the background of her book on Safiya Dulip Singh and mm -hmm. on my book on, uh, on the First Afghan War. Okay. Uh, and so we both knew a little about it from our previous work. We both we met one day and we said, no, this just isn't right. Yeah. That this history is, is way off. <laughs> um, and so we decided to spend six months um, working together. First time either of us had collaborated on a book. Okay. Uh, and she knew, she, the, well, I, the Brit living in India, did the Indian side of the story. And she, the Indian living in Britain, did the British side of the story. story. Uh, and we would sort of compete for atrocities. It's a That's book nice. full of horrors. Uh, it's, it's like Game of Thrones. It, <laughs> every episode has a new horror story. <laughs> new story. Um, and it's a sort of cross between Game of Thrones on one hand and Lord of the Rings because it also has the, the Kohinoor is like the Ring of Power. It's this yeah. thing that <laughs> corrupts everything it comes into, and it's this sort of object of enormous desire, desire. Yes. which attracts people and makes them behave extremely badly. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, um, for young writers who aspire to be like you. What skills do you think they would need to be a writer like you? So, being a writer is not something that you can learn in the same way that you can learn engineering. Okay. Uh, you, you can, you know, if you want to become an engineer in general, if you're numerate, mm. you can go to engineering college and come out with a degree and you can build bridges. Yes. It's not like that with <laughs> being a writer. Um, a, it's something that can't really be taught. I mean, there are endless creative writing yes. courses that can help. But uh, if you haven't, and like, just like painting, if you can't paint, you can go to any number of art companies yes. and you're not going to be able to be a paint. great artist. Um, equally, in a way, you know, many of the greatest writers, most of the greatest writers, have never been on a course. So mm -hmm. you, you, you start writing uh, as a product of what you read, read. really. And, and in a sense, the best way to prepare to being a writer is just to sit on the, on the couch and, and open a book uh, and discover what you love and, and, and then discover the authors that really make your heart right. beat a bit faster and then begin writing like them or, or see how you can adapt your style to, to do what they do or whatever the kind of magic that they work on you. And, yeah. and I think most artists start by imitating the artists that they admire most. Admire so most. for example, early Beethoven yeah. sounds very like Mozart. Yes. And then it becomes Beethoven. It becomes Beethoven yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's very innate. And yeah. So you, I mean, I certainly started by writing slightly in the manner of all those 1930s travel writers that mm -hmm. I loved, like Robert Barr and Peter Fleming, mm -hmm. um, Evelyn Waugh, uh, Eric Newby, slightly later writer. Uh, and then, you know, gradually get into your own yeah. You learn, your own, your, you learn how to do it your, in your own in voice. Yeah. So it's more of an innate kind of process rather than... So I think it's, it's a... Yes, it's, it's... I think it is slightly like painting in that you either can do it or you can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but once you start doing it, it is a process that an enormous amount of editing and, and re-editing mm. and work and polishing Actually. can make better. Uh, one of the things you learn as a writer is that there are moments when you know it comes as if by dictation from angels. Very occasionally, you do write yeah. something wonderful. And I think, you know, where did that come from? Yeah. <laughs> I, I did I that. Didn't do that. <laughs> but those days are very few and far between. And most days, you're pushing, you know, the the 
pushing the the, the, the snow in front of you yeah. and, uh, uh, and and you're making heavy weather through that empty that page empty on the page. screen yeah. um, and then every so often the god smile and, and, <laughs> and, and, the, and, and a fluent passage and something will come yeah. across but the more I look at the work of writers I really admire they yeah. almost always it's uh, uh, it comes through a process of editing and re-editing and re-editing and the really great prose writers are those who go back and back, back. and back and chisel away and just like it's like in a sense more like sculpture than, than another just keep going keep until going. it's gorgeous you polish it again you chip away a bit more and, and then finally until you're happy uh, you're happy <laughs> at the end of it yeah. be perfectionist so how do you see the younger generation and their inclination towards literature in india specifically yeah in yeah. india specifically so, I mean, the cliche is that everyone's stuck to their phones now yeah. and, uh, and they're too busy with Instagram and, yeah. uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, Facebook or uh, Tinder to bother with, with books. But th I think that is nonsense. I think uh, if anything has been displaced by that, it's TV and, and the movies. Hmm. Uh, reading continues. And the, the numbers we're getting at the Jai Pulit Tree Festival are half a million this year. Wow. Now, Obviously, it's now a big spectacle. We have Bollywood stars, we have cricket stars. So, of that half a million, there are a, a large number of people who've come with their Dior sunglasses <laughs> to uh, do selfies in front of in, fr in front of whoever Sohar Ali Khan, whoever is yeah. there. Yeah. But even if you allow that, maybe a third of the people that have come there for the selfie spectacle hang out yeah, thing, yeah. there are, you know, at every session these eager earnest kids hand shooting up with an angry question about this or how can you say this yeah. or why have you not said this or uh, and they're really engaged um, and uh, mm. we and we sell lots and lots and lots of books we sell hundreds of thousands of books a wow. week. Uh, so um, writing is alive and well it's alive uh, and I mean, well. obviously it's not everyone's cup of tea yeah uh, it's not every not everyone is going to want to hear a writer speak and not everyone's going to want to read or write yeah but uh, it remains, I think, a, a very strong minority interest. That's so fresh uh, to hear. Yeah, and, so and, and the numbers, yeah. I mean, the sh astonishing numbers we're getting. That's uh, so And they come from, you know, they come from Tamil Nadu, they come from Assam, they, they come, come from, from Gujarat. Some of the times they're, they're camping rough in J Jaipur railway station, they can't afford a room, they're still there. And, still and there. you see they spent the money they could have spent on a hostel, yeah. on a book. You know, wow. And it, it's, very, it's, it's lovely. Yeah. It's lovely. Yeah. Contrary to popular yeah. Yeah. opinion. Okay, so why the literature, uh, Jaipur Literature Festival? Um, it's such an international feast of cultural connections and new perspectives. What motivated you to start this? So I didn't start it alone. It, we were the three of us that put it together. We're still the three that run it. Uh, mm -hmm. Sanjoy is our producer. Namata Gokhali uh, does particularly the Basha, the, the non-English and the uh, and the Indian stuff. I do mainly the foreign stuff, but again, but there's a huge amount of inter, uh, mm -hmm. intermingling. I do quite a lot of Indian art, for example, which is something I'm keen on. She's much more knowledgeable about China and uh, and uh, the Scandinavian, Scandinavian stuff, for example, than I am. So, so we have we have our different interests, and we're slightly. I think it works as well as it do, it does as a threesome. Is in that it's like, like a three-legged stool. In that each one of us has so different interests and such different talents that we you move one leg and the whole thing falls over. Falls, yeah. um, I mean, I could, no way could I you know, discover the Bengali poets or the sort of Punjabi bards or the uh, feminist writers in Kerala that Namata does. But equally, I think, you know, she'd be quite hard pressed to have the her knowledge of the Caribbean writers mm. that I've managed to build up. And, and ditto, neither of us could do Sandro's job, which, yeah. is, which is, you know, this amazing logistical feat of, of pulling off this pulling enormous off, thing. Yeah. So it's been a very successful partnership. Yeah. Um, why did we do it? I think we, I, all three of us would have different answers to that. For me, it was that literary festivals in the 1980s and 90s were springing up all over the world. Mm -hmm. And it was odd that there was nothing in India because Indian writers were everywhere. You'd go to Hay on Wai, you go to Penn, New York, you'd go to Sydney Writers' Festival. There's and you would see way. Vikram Seth, Harandati, Roy Amtab Ghosh. And there was this odd situation in about sort of the turn of the, the, the century when you would see Indian writers everywhere except India. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so it made instant se uh, sense uh, and to logic to the when, when, we, when we put up this uh, 
uh, range of writers initially within, within the Jaipur Varasat festival, which was a general her uh, heritage festival of, of Rajasthan, um, that people react to that very strongly. And then we outgrew, in a sense, the, the mother festival. And, mm -hmm. and then we, there was a split at one point. The music and the dance went off and became the Jodhpur Riff. Mm -hmm. the Rajasthan International Folk Festival and we oh, stayed wow. in Jaipur as the Jaipur Literature Festival. festival. So now there's two festivals, uh, oh, which is lovely. that's beautiful <laughs> that it, two festivals have come out of it. Um, what importance does a literature festival hold in today's age and time? So, literature festivals obviously fulfill a range of different functions. Yep. On one hand, I suppose we're simple entertainment. Yeah, it's where we, you know, it's 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 a stimulating weekend away for someone in Delhi or Bombay or yeah. indeed from London. Um, there's also a great deal of education. Mm -hmm. uh, we in the course of Jaipur, I mean, last year I think we had ten tenured professors from Harvard, five Oxbridge. We had three Nobel Prize winners, two Booker winners, two wow. Pulitzer winners. So, and it's all for free. So it's like a huge super, super university pitching its tent for a weekend, yeah, um, so a long weekend, and you know, massive. You know, you can where else in the world can you hear a Nobel Prize winner for free? Yes, nowhere, you know, uh, and uh, so it's somewhere on that cusp between um, education, literature, and entertainment. Entertainment. And but we're, we're, we're very clear though that it's not. I mean, in the old days in India used to be used to have these sort of Sahitya Academy book launches where lots of very solemn people would sit around picking the book being launched apart. <laughs> <laughs> and well, I disagreed. <laughs> and then there'd be tea and samosas, and everyone would go off feeling slightly miserable. Um, Jaipur is very consciously sort of sort of tries to throw in you know the great indian wedding <laughs> at the same time. We, we are you know at the end of the evening there's partying there's, there's, uh, there's music, music there's fun and, there's, fun and dance um and it's a lot of fun uh it's uh, it's like monsoon wedding you know yeah. <laughs> um so uh yeah no it's it, 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 it's not a mournful occasion it is a festival it is festive why is it jaipur literature festival and jodhpur dance Oh, just the way it panned out. Okay. Um, it's in Jaipur because it started in Jaipur. Okay. Faith and John Singh started this Jaipur Varasat festival. Mm -hmm. They were this amazing couple who had started Anoki. Then when they retired, they wanted to do a celebration of the arts of Rajasthan. Mm -hmm. They invited me to come and do a, uh, a reading. I then got in Namata the following year to bring in uh, uh, the Rajasthani audiences mm -hmm. and Rajasthani writing, which I didn't know anything about. And, and it grew, and that's kind of it grew, grew from, from that. Um, okay. So we stayed in Jaipur, and and I mean, had we gone out and you know got focus groups and done exploratory studies and and done the full kind of business thing, we could not have chosen a better centre than Jaipur. Jaipur. It has hundreds of uh, amazing hotels, which you know uh, it, the perfect weather in January. There's nothing else on at the same time. All the big yeah. festivals in the west are in in the summer. summer. Um, it's got good air links with everywhere. Uh, it was a very, very, it looks like a very, very smart decision. In fact, it was a very, very lucky decision. Okay. Uh, and entirely because Faith and John lived in Jaipur and wanted to do a, a festival themselves. But uh, literally, had we, had we sort of, you know, commissioned studies, we could not have, I think, come up, with, come up with a better place or at a better time of year. And a lot of the success has come from the fact that people just love going to Jaipur, yeah. and particularly in January. <laughs> and everywhere else in the world is miserable. I mean, you don't want to be in London in January. <laughs> you know, it's a bit hot here in Adelaide. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of freezing snow so in New York. Uh, and Jaipur's gorgeous. Jaipur is the perfect yeah. place for it. Lovely. Um, so what do you think needs to be done to, to keep this industry thriving, apart from having such beautiful literature festivals? Which industry are you talking about? The literature. Industry, Nothing particularly needs to be done. It's thriving. It's thriving, but uh, it's thriving. I mean, we uh, we double in size every year. Our problem is mm. is that we haven't got room for everyone, <laughs> <laughs> um, and the number of book sales doubles every year. Uh, there is no and uh, and in general, publishing in India, contrary to the trend in the whole uh, wider world, mm -hmm. is also flourishing. A lot of many foreign publishers are opening up in India every year. Uh, literary agencies are expanding, looking for scouting for talent. Uh, wow. No, this is a boom, a boom yeah. area. That's so sort of fresh to hear because yeah. most people you would most most people would assume the other way around Correct. because of the digital space. But Correct. That's, that's very good to hear. There is also, I mean, I think there's two different things which are happening. One is publishing is still expanding in India, which yep. is extremely unusual. Mm -hmm. But there's also uh, something which is going with 
current trends, which is that everywhere, I think, in the world, when one's spending more time on one's phone, mm. um, there is a premium on reality. Yeah. So if you're constantly either on your phone or looking at a screen in the office, to, to actually see the band live, to hear the author speak, uh, this is now a greater treat than ever because yes. you know, we live so much, our life is pixelated. Pixel, yeah. Uh, and so to actually see the flesh and blood, whether it's a Rolling Stones tour, that's so true. or whether it's Jhumpa Lahiri in person. It's really uh, such a luxury. Uh, and that's true everywhere. So, yeah. you know, this is why you find all these old monsters of rock reforming <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, Bob Dylan and the Stones and uh, everyone still sort of, Dylan's you know, attracting so peak audiences. Because, yeah. you know, we spend our lives with our headphones on listening to them. Yeah. Uh, and now we can actually see them. See them. And that's true of as much that's of authors as of musicians. Yeah. That's, that's so, so good to hear and such a good perspective. Well, thank you so much for your thank time, you. William. It was amazing. Thank it was you. such a wonderful conversation. It's been such an honor to speak to you and pick your brain. Um, I'm Karishma from In This Age. And until next time. Australia's thanks. first Indian magazine to have a national reach. In This Age is the largest circulated South Asian magazine in Australia with five simultaneous editions. 55,000 copies printed monthly. 220,000 readers. Largest network of clients. Undisputed leader in community news. In This Age is circulated in Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Brisbane and Perth to over 525 outlets. Grab your copy now to get the latest on the community, news from India, Bollywood, music and much more. For more info, log on to www.indisage.com.au age.com.au